Hello, this is Stephanie. And this is Brian. Welcome to the making and the remaking of a codependent mind. This, this time we're going to talk about something that gives a different angle to the, the idea of codependency and how it may show up in different types of people. It's the, the topic of gender. How does gender intersect with codependency and codependent behaviors? Right, and how there may be different experiences depending on the gender and, and how it may be viewed by people in general. Um, and that's really the uh, kind of what we want to talk about, what, how gender is viewed and what our experiences have been with the whole idea of it. How would you describe what we mean by gender for the sake of this conversation? Yeah, so we're going to be talking about gender as these two categories, men and women, that have been used and continue to be used to carve up the human population. Mm. So we as humans use a lot of different ways to differentiate ourselves from others and to categorize groups of people, race, nationality, ethnicity, religion, religion. Gender seems to be one of the oldest categories that we've used, and it seems pretty pervasive throughout human cultures. Using the biological difference between males and females to categorize people as different genders, Mm -hmm. girls, women, boys, men. And I think in our culture at this particular time, the gender categories are still fairly rigid. They have been rigid for quite a while. Mm -hmm. (laughs) That may be changing in some of our communities and some of our cultures. But in North American culture, the gender distinction is, is still fairly rigid. And people are pretty resistant to efforts to make it more fluid. And it's kind of interesting to see how that resistance shows up. Some people get very upset. (laughs) Right. (laughs) So we're going to be just talking about these two categories of men and women. And again, each culture that that these categories exist in load up the idea of womanhood and the idea of manhood Mm -hmm. with a bunch of different meanings and expectations and constraints and opportunities. Because these categories aren't just biological categories at this point they're used as social categories as political categories as financial categories yeah whether or not there needs to be a distinction i mean other than biological distinction there is there certainly is and and again it's been one in most human cultures for recorded human history so it likely we're not going to get away from them anytime mm. soon so we just wanted to talk about how these categories these categories of womanhood and manhood of masculinity and femininity have intersected with your experience of codependency mm-hmm. and may may intersect with other people's experiences as well and obviously we're coming to this discussion this conversation between the two of us from our own gendered perspectives So for myself, I was born female and I was raised as a girl and now am seen as a woman. And then you yeah, born as born male and male and raised as a boy and turned into a man. So other people and other listeners, you know, may have a very different experience of gender. And similarly, there are other kind of social constructions that may intersect with codependency in very interesting ways. For Mm -hmm. instance, uh, you mentioned religion, and um, we're also coming from white bodies. Uh, Mm -hmm. I mean, I think race may intersect with codependency in compelling ways. And in the last episode we had, we started our series of guests episodes. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the reasons, again, that we wanted to do that is to hear from these other voices, hear from people who have experienced and struggled with codependency and have come from backgrounds and perspectives that you, Brian, can or me, Stephanie, can particularly represent yeah. or speak to. I mean, there's. It's not helpful for me to try to speculate what somebody else's experience would be in, in a completely different. You know, so I, I I've tried to just stick to to mine, to my experience, to what I know, and hopefully it's it's still helpful to people that may be coming from a different angle. But we'd like to hear some of those angles. I definitely do. Absolutely. I think it'll strengthen my knowledge on codependency. So the reason why we wanted to have this discussion about gender, I think, is to see how it relates to codependency. And so what what are you thinking is this link to why why this is an important discussion to have? I think there are two kind of major themes that we're going to explore. The first one being gender as a source of trauma. Because I think that gender, as can race, as can religion, as can other social structures, be a mechanism for trauma. Insofar as these are constructs, ideas, 
that come with a lot of expectations and constraints. Yeah, right. So once you've been born female or born male and identified as a girl or a boy, society thinks that it knows a bunch of stuff about you. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Knows how you should behave, how you should present in the world, even what your inner life looks like. Not everyone, obviously. <laughs> Some people have a much more nuanced view of gender but the over you know our our culture overwhelmingly places these kind of expectations and again thinks that they know something about you if you are identified as a girl or a woman or identified as a boy or as a man and anything that i think does that that lays out this set of this is what being a girl means this is what being a boy means this is what being a woman means this is what being a man means let's say masculine feminine this is what being feminine means when you're young, especially, to get those messages and to feel that you are that you might be failing to live up to those expectations can be a traumatic experience mm-hmm. because you can internalize that as something is wrong with me. Which is what shame is. Shame is believing there's something wrong with you. Yeah, so if someone's telling you this is how you're supposed to act and I find myself struggling to act that way for whatever reason... I'm just going to assume it's because I can't. There's something wrong with me. Yes, you're not going to, as a child, have the ability, especially as a young child, to say that it's the adults or the larger culture that's wrong and you are going to be be true to yourself. The impulse is going to be, as you say, to feel shame. Yeah. It's to feel there's something wrong with you. And then if you fail to comply with these expectations for your behavior, the results could be devastating you could be unloved and uncared for and kind of removed from your community yeah cast out of society because shame is a signal and sometimes it's a good signal i'm doing something actually i'm doing something wrong and i need to correct my behavior but it's also a very damaging one there's absolutely nothing you can do you're you're doing something you don't want to do because it's something you think you have to for whatever reason it's the message you're being given So I I suspect a lot of people, especially ones who were in communities where gender roles were very rigid, I suspect a lot of people received gender messages in a way that was traumatic and very difficult to integrate. I fortunately, I don't think I did have a traumatic experience with gender. I don't say, I won't say it's always been pleasant. Yeah, right. More or less, I seem to buy luck (laughs) or circumstance fit into the gender role that was being asked for me sometimes not so much how did you feel when you didn't so much do you you remember what that felt like i don't think i got messages really i'm I'm certainly i didn't get any direct messages from my parents on gender expectations i think there was a willingness on both of their parts to let me be me (laughs) Mm. so i think that if I did receive shame messages from, from other people, I had a fairly strong foundation that it was not, I was not the problem. Mm-hmm. That's good, yeah. That it, that it was okay. But it was, uh, you know, it, I mean, I remember all the way through my childhood, certainly, I certainly remember them. I remember those messages. And yeah, they're, they're not great. <laughs> they're, yeah. It's not great to have something that you, first of all, I mean, we talked about this in the shame, that you can't change uh, and to have people try to make that a source of shame. You can pretend to change, to change, right? I mean, yep. that's kind of what it comes down to, right? Oh, I'm gonna, I don't feel, I don't identify with this, but I'm gonna, I'm just gonna pretend I do. Right, and then, so then we start to hear the winds of codependency. <laughs> right, right, I know. <laughs> Which is essentially what that is, right? Yeah, so yeah. Like, like other people's expectations, what they need from you is more important than who you are. So you know, if people yeah. like need that you behave in a certain way, in a in a masculine way or a feminine way. You're like, oh, well, I have to do that, Dep- regardless of that. That's not authentic to who am I, who I am. So that wasn't a regular thing for you to to do that, right? So if you didn't internalize things as much as shame as as maybe say I did, obviously. Right. So I think, yeah. Again, I mean, I had I had an okay experience mm-hmm. with my with my gender. It's not like I ever for myself, identified it that closely. Uh, I never felt girlish, for for instance. I never felt that this was an identity that I was drawn to, but it was also not a, an identity that was terribly uncomfortable for me either. 
uh, you had a little bit of a rougher time. Yeah, I did. I mean, as we talked about with my kind of the way I was set up to not be able to handle shame right from the start kind mm-hmm. of, uh, because of what I had going on um, in my life, you know, the, the friendship with G, my dad, just my, the way I handled and internalized everything is shame. Kind of that was a habitual thing for me. Right. So your dad's anger and impatience and frustration yeah. with the world, but also not infrequently with you, you internalized very early on as shame. There was something wrong with you. Yeah. The, the, your, behavior, your behavior and then you were, were causing this, him to have these outbursts. Right. So these messages that I was starting to receive about what boys were supposed to be like and, and men, you know, I see that kind of indirectly, you know, but mostly I'm in the world of boys. Mm-hmm. And you were in very gendered spaces. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. I mean, I was in a co-ed school, but I went to things like Boy Scouts. Very, and I started in Cub Scouts. So I was always in these kind of clubs like that where there was nothing but boys around. And sports. Sports. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I played baseball and soccer starting very young, t-ball and stuff like that. So I was always in these groups of just boys. It seemed to always get worse when it was only just boys around. It's worse being these messages and how they were enforced. Um, I think a lot of boys tried to behave a little better when they were around girls, but the way the messages were enforced were almost part of what made you masculine is what is one, something that I think I caught on to, right? So not only was I, did I feel like I wasn't living up to what the messages were, which were basically, it amounted to uh, just don't be weak. Don't look weak. Don't act weak. And I did. I mean, I, and part of, it was this kind of vicious cycle because I acted and looked weak because I didn't want to be noticed. <laughs> I was looking down, not making eye contact with people. And so, so that's, that's weak alone, right? I mean, because part of not looking weak is being confident, being assertive, uh, speaking directly to people and speaking your minds, telling it like it is, things like that. And that was the view that was being pushed of that's what men, boys were supposed to be like. So part of that, as I was saying, was the way it was delivered. And I didn't want to participate in that, A, because I didn't feel like I identified with these personality traits. I didn't feel like I was confident or assertive. Um, or aggressive. Or aggressive, right. I aggressive mean, was a big thing, right? Yeah, I mean, these weren't really kind of, which makes sense, right? The boys trying on different personalities. But mm-hmm. these, this wasn't a sense of healthy confidence or sort of... No, right. This, this was kind of very immature versions of that yeah. you know, delivered as, as aggression, really. Right. And then actually delivering it seemed to be part of it. It was almost like in order to be perceived as confident and assertive and, and aggressive, you had to be shaming others for not being aggressive and mm-hmm. confident and assertive. The people that pulled it off were just the people that just made it their whole personality kind of, you know, like obviously these people probably had their own trauma that they were dealing with and that's how they dealt with it. So you went into these gendered spaces, these masculine spaces already set up to feel shame, already sensing that something was wrong with you. And then these spaces were full of messages about who you had to be in order to be accepted and safe in those groups. And that didn't really match who you felt you were. <laughs> no, I, I didn't feel any of those things. I, so I didn't feel like I lived up to them at all. And it just made me feel extremely isolated, really. So gender became both a source of shame and that you felt you weren't living up to it and also fear that you felt you would be exposed for yeah. not living up to it and and literally kind of attacked. Yeah, yeah. because the, the, when, when I look back at my, my observations of like how many times did I get attacked directly for this stuff, on average, if I were to, to say the amount of times that I witnessed people being attacked versus me being attacked. It was like 95% other people being attacked because I, I was trying my best to not be attacked. You know, just all these behaviors that I came up with, this avoidance and trying to make myself small and invisible, but also the codependent behavior. So if someone does attack me, I need to know how to respond to that. So I'm not going to respond by fighting back. I'm going to respond by just placating the person somehow. Let me, what can I do to diffuse this situation and make this person... F- not be aggressive anymore. And this continued pretty much all the way through your school life Mm -hmm. and probably contributed to your sense of social anxiety, the sexual shame that we talked about in the previous episodes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because that's a big part. That that was a big part of what was going on with this masculinity. A huge thread. You know, like I said, part of it was, was insulting others, you know, but and part of that insulting others was saying, 
you do this like a girl or you had like a girl or you do this like you're a homosexual or something like that. The, the insults were based around you're not living up to your gender role. Mm-hmm. But it, it's kind of funny when I think about, not funny, but they're also attacking women and homosexual people at the same time. It's just like the, kind of this big blanket, anyone that doesn't conform to any role, but also attacking women and just that, oh, women are weak, but they're expected to be weak. Mm-hmm. We know they are. They're weaker than men. They're too emotional, whatever it is. So there's roles that these men placed on the women at the same time. And then they're saying, well, don't be like that. You need to be like this. And that's particularly interesting when we get to the R relationship. She explicitly used gendered language to shame and abuse you. Yes. Yeah. I mean, it became all about that. Um, like I said, she when we, we went into that episode, it, it, I mean, ultimately, it, it all tied back to sex, but she, she tied it back to sex. It didn't start that way. She needed something to tie it together to just make it a neat package and make it easier to to have the complete 100% control. But yeah, it started off as just like, oh, you lack confidence. You lack masculinity. I mean, she used that word. I mean, when it wasn't descriptive enough to say that I wasn't confident or I wasn't assertive, it was just like, oh, oh, it's because you're not masculine. Yeah, and then, then, although she didn't seem to think about the ways in which that might implicate her and her femininity. <laughs> oh, right. I know. Yeah. Why are you with a person that is not masculine when you say that's what you want well also is she not feminine enough yeah right (laughs) like she's not playing her role well enough well i mean oddly enough she did seem to kind of try to use masculine traits Mm -hmm. (laughs) what she she described what i've grew up learning were masculine traits that was kind of how she behaved most of the time it was just odd it was it was it was a little um it took me by surprise i didn't really because when I think back to my childhood, elementary school and things like that, I didn't hear girls doing those kind of insults. I mean, I just I, I just felt safer with the gender in general. I don't know if that's you know, has to do with the roles that the women were supposed to be playing. I mean, that's something that we can get into. That's something we're gonna talk about, yeah. Although yeah. I mean but, you know, yes, girls can be plenty. Oh uh, yeah. <laughs> vicious. <laughs> I'm sure, right? <laughs> Absolutely they can be vicious. And yeah. And I mean, obviously, R was, and yeah. there was this gender language that was very easy for her to pick up and was very easy for her to use as a weapon. I mean, she exploited these things because I made it clear from our very first meeting that I lacked these masculine traits. And so it was super easy target. And I, I'm already used to doing whatever I need to do to try to placate people that are attacking me. So Yeah, I mean, that's one thread in terms of how gender plays a role in codependency is that gender, because it is a social construct that's supposed to be saying something very true and intimate about females and and males, it's easy to weaponize that language and those expectations. And it's been weaponized against girls and against boys for a long, long time Mm -hmm. in so many cultures and absolutely can be part of the trauma package because it becomes part of the shame package. Yeah. I mean, really, when I think about any time, most of the time when I heard anything related to masculinity and femininity growing up like what it meant to be a man or a boy or a woman or a girl it was wrapped in some kind of condescending or abusive package i mean that's usually how people talked about it i i rarely heard good constructive conversations about about these things so yeah i mean i was just full of fear anytime the subject came up the fact that i didn't line up to with these things and there's not usually a lot of room for you to decide what it means for you to be a man or what it means for you to be a woman. That's that. Those aren't usually the conversations that are encouraged because it's kind of the opposite of what they're there for. They're, they're, they're designed mostly to control behavior and dr- control and direct behavior. And again, if you're comfortable with the expectations that are placed on, on you, then you can do, you know, people can do fairly well within those constraints. If you're not comfortable, then what you're going to end up having to do is adopt some of these codependent behaviors Mm -hmm. and try to match yourself with other people's needs and expectations rather than figure out who you are for yourself. One of the big ones that I forgot to mention was emotions. I kind of mentioned that like, oh, you do this like a girl, you cry like a girl or something like that being that women are the emotional ones and men are not supposed to show their emotions. Or if they do, it's only aggressive emotions that are acceptable, more or less, you know, um, or pleasure or something like that. But, but definitely not sadness or fear. Well, okay, well, let's, let's talk about that. Because Mm -hmm. it's, it isn't true, actually, that women are allowed to be emotional. 
Yeah. Well, okay. Yeah. Okay. Good point. Right. Because they're not, you said that men are allowed to be aggressive and angry. Women are not. Right. That's true. Right, right, right. No, it's like, oh, they, they, they just are because they're weak. That's, that's more the, the trend. So, right. So this is the other thread that, or kind of area that I wanted to talk about. Okay. So the first one being gender is as a, a source of trauma, as a trauma mechanism. But then also, I found it very interesting, as we learned about codependency, the way that codependent behaviors and traits line up, unfortunately, a little too cleanly with feminine traits sure, and right. expectations and behaviors. Traits and behaviors that are coded as feminine have a lot in common with traits and behaviors that arise in codependency. And it made me think so it made me think actually of this article i read many many years ago so i don't remember who wrote it or what it was about but it made just this one point that has really stuck with me that traits that are considered masculine are traits of people who have power and need to use it traits that are considered feminine are traits of people who don't have power but need to live and interact with those who do Oh, wow. Hmm. So if we think of some, what are some things that we think of as masculine traits? You mentioned confidence, mm -hmm. uh, assertiveness. Aggressiveness. Uh, aggressiveness and taking what you want, knowing what you want and going for it. and Strength, courage. Okay, yeah. Leadership. Right. Right. Taking control. These are all seen as ambition, seen as kind of masculine traits. Uh -huh. Right. These are all expectations that we have or that our culture has, of people who belong in the category of men traditionally. So those are all traits that are very helpful to have if you have power and exercise, need to exercise power. So these are, these are traits that we would expect to see from powerful people in our culture. Sure. And then the feminine traits would be kindness, compassion, caring. Empathy. Empathy. Yeah, caretaking. So these are all traits that it was. it's very useful to have if you yourself do not have much power and you need to interact with more powerful people. Just make sure they feel cared for and support, it, support them. You don't have access to direct power. You mm. cannot make things happen directly in the world. I mean, that's what we talked about, personal power, the sense of personal agency, personal power, that you feel that you can take actions mm -hmm. on your own behalf and make changes in the world. Well, if you don't feel that way, then it's no use being assertive and confident and brave. Right. <laughs> what you need to be is collaborative and kind and caring in order so that the powerful people will allow you to act or will help you and protect yeah. you. And, of course, what we have in our culture and in many, many cultures for a long, long time is, a, is men having access to direct power and women having access to power mainly through their relationships and their relationships to men. So they needed to maintain those relationships. They need to be the ones to maintain those relationships because it was through the man or the males in their life that they had, that was the only way they had access to political power, to social power, to financial power, to physical power, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So yes, so when we, we list these feminine traits, we see a lot of the codependent behaviors. Yeah, yeah. Whether, whether they're genuine or not, right? They're, they're behaviors that are used. Absolutely, yeah, because we've, this is what we've, how we've talked about codependency is you were in, in a powerless position as a young child and you needed some way to placate the powerful people around you to keep yourself safe, to be safe by managing their emotions and their expectations. A lot of times when codependency is represented, it is represented in a gendered way in that the codependent is, is the woman. Mm -hmm. Similarly, a lot of times the way narcissism is represented it is also represented as gendered. The men being the narcissist and the right. woman being the codependent. Narcissistic traits line up very well with masculine traits. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. Just That's the way true. codependent behaviors line up well with feminine traits. And I don't think there's been any studies as to if there is, in fact, more male narcissists or and more How female. How would you even do that study? I know. <laughs> Who's going to take the test? But certainly you can see how, again, the cultural messages that we would get around gender, if there was a boy or a man leaning towards narcissism, there would be a lot of messages from his culture encouraging him in that. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. Like not checking that. Mm -hmm. And similarly, if there was a girl or 
a woman who was starting to behave more codependently, she would get a lot of messages that that's appropriate and Mm -hmm. fine. Mm -hmm. That women are supposed to be caretaking. Women are supposed to put other people first. Women are supposed to be giving and caring and empathetic and dealing with other people's feelings. That's the expectation. So you could see how gender in that case, even if it wasn't the source of the original trauma, it would become a way to deepen and reinforce those behaviors in women. Right. To kind of justify it. Right. Mm-hmm. Like this is, well, this is what I'm expected to act like anyway. So what's the problem here? There's maybe no problem for everyone around her. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> but meanwhile, she's giving up her life and mm-hmm. her health and her emotional well-being in yeah. order to be this perfect woman, which is really just codependently, reflexively thinking that she has no right to her own emotions and her own time and her own sense of herself as a, as a being in the world. Yeah, I mean, obviously, I can't speak to this because I'm not a woman, but I imagine it doesn't feel any better to not be true to yourself, whether it's expected of you or not. Yeah, it's a good point, right? I mean, just right, just because they're supposedly doing well as women, be- mm-hmm. because they're satisfying ex- cultural expectations of them as women, that doesn't mean that they feel any better about right. their lives or that their that their relationships are are any more healthy or sustaining for them. Yeah, they, they there's. Probably just as much of a chance for a complete self disconnect and feeling of shame as if not living up to your own your own standards, whatever those are. So maybe the final point to kind of that we want to make about gender is that yeah, not only can be a source of trauma, a mm-hmm. trauma mechanism, it also can be problematic in deepening and reinforcing codependent behavior habits, especially with women, because it lines up too neatly with <laughs> expectations mm-hmm. that society already has from women. And then finally, it can be very problematic in identifying the codependent behaviors and, and healing from them because their gender disguises, disguises them. Yeah. So with a woman, oh, society is supporting those behaviors. So it's more difficult to recognize that they're a problem. That they're unhealthy, that they're toxic to the person that's, that's doing them at that point. Yeah. And then one of the bigger ones I see on my end was avoidance of emotions and that being supported by the masculine role. And then me, while avoiding my emotions, making these massive life errors because I don't have any connection to reality of what I actually want. I remember when we would, when we were first going out and occasionally we might have some, we wouldn't even say it was a fight, right? We just maybe have a disagreement or something, but you would start talking about the disagreements or fights that you would have with R and J and you would, mm. you would characterize them as they were just too emotional and you, right. could, you couldn't talk to them and, you know, it was, you couldn't have a rational conversation, which of course, well, that wasn't going on. No, it wasn't what was going on. I was using the language though. Yeah, right? you were using this language to, to try to understand what was happening to you and it was just bad language. And then, you, you know, you also had the, the issue, we, we talked about a number of therapists that you went to and, and a couple therapists that even use the word abuse, um, but therapists also that played into this masculine talk that are you narrative that are had about you so that gen- expectations of you as a man as being the most more powerful physical one financial one etc disguise the the abuse that you were suffering mm-hmm. and the power and the control yeah. that both r and j executed over you and it kept me in the shame loop too because i felt as though well i want to be confident because who would who doesn't i still want to be confident and i actually am gaining confidence but not because it's just something I could just get. Well, and also because you thought, well, you, you are the man and you do have the financial power. They're the ones that are, quote unquote, dependent on you. Mm-hmm, right. So just even disguising for yourself what the dynamic was. Mm-hmm. Whereas I think that if you had been the female partner and R&J had been the male partner and you told therapists or friends or family the behaviors that you were on the receiving end of it would be, it would have been much easier for people to say well that's an abusive situation yeah, and sure. you need to leave that's a dangerous situation so it can disguise both ways what actually is happening in people's lives mm-hmm. if they're clouded by these stories about gender especially if i'm participating in those stories like you said in those early conversations so because mm-hmm. I've struggled to remember details of of those therapy sessions, like how exactly did I present this stuff? You know, I know at best that I remember bringing R's narrative and things like that, 
about, oh, I just wish I could be more confident and stuff like that. But what else did I say that just kept it on a completely wrong track? Like I, I came nowhere near any of this stuff, trauma, shame, codependency, didn't come anywhere near it. And similarly, again, if you have women talking about their lives and talking about their these behaviors, that it, behaviors match so well of the gender expectations of them, it can disguise the ways in which those behaviors are, are so damaging to so many women and put them into unhealthy and unsafe relationships and situations. Right. So what really winds up being helpful is just collapsing, throwing out those those views. Those categories, yeah. especially when you're trying to figure out the truth about your life and the yeah. truth about who you are as a person outside of whatever expectations society has from you, whether they come from your gender or your race or your ethnic background. Right. So this is another great example of kind of what we're looking for when we are talking about wanting to talk to people about their experiences and trying to find some people that would be willing to tell us their story and, and come on the podcast. Because there are so many different experiences out there that fall into these different constructs. So you can reach us if you are interested in being a guest at codependentmind at gmail.com. And we want to thank everyone who's become a, a patron of the podcast on Patreon. We really appreciate your support. Yes, thank you so much. And please join us next time for another topic. Mm-hmm.